Hello, rather than do our standard surgical myectomy video, which is often very challenging to see when we're working inside the ventricle, I thought I'd use a 3D model to focus on understanding the three-dimensional septal anatomy. I have no disclosures. This is a 3D anatomic representation of a patient of mine that had undergone a septal myectomy. In this view, the right ventricle had been removed, so you are looking at the septum. Important things to note is that what we call the anterior septum is colored in green. The infraseptum is colored in red, and I will show you some other anatomic landmarks and right here in this orange line with purple is the base of the right coronary cusp. So again, and I'll show this again, this is as if the right ventricular free wall has been removed. So here's a picture of this patient's anatomy. You can see the septum. I have measurements here. Here's the right ventricle. We call this half the anteroseptum. And in this patient, it measures 18.4 millimeters. It is almost uniformly thicker than the infraseptum, which in this case is 14 millimeters. Now imagine that we take this anterior sept or this right ventricular free wall off, and we will be looking directly down on the septum. And note this little inflection pointer bend right there. So here it is again. Right ventricle removed. Here's the aortic root. This green is the anteroseptum shown here, and it was 18 millimeters in thickness. I'll show it from another view. And the infraseptum in red is over here. In this particular case, uh, and well shown by the 3D model, a portion of the proximal third of the LED was intramyocardial. It's important to recognize that the septum is a spiral, spiraling from base counterclockwise to the apex. This is with the right ventricular free wall removed. So this is the septal spiral. And you can see that here with the anterior septum over here and with the RV moved away as shown with this, this square, the infraseptum is shown here. And that typical spiral as we go from base to apex happens in almost all the hearts we see. There can be some variability, but this is a very common uh, pattern in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. In uh, all my talks, I always start with emphasizing understanding the intraoperative transesophageal echo views. There's two specific views. These are MR images, but they conform to the transesophageal echo. And this would be the typical view in the 135 degrees. It's usually turned the other way, but it's very similar. You have the aorta, the mitral valve, the apex of the heart, and then you have this portion of the septum. And this portion of the septum, the anterior septum is shown here, is reflected in this green portion of the model with the RV free wall removed. And, and note that the anterior septum lies right beneath the nadir of the right coronary cusp. This is really important when I show it from another view. The four chamber view on echo with the right ventricle here, the left ventricle, tricusp and mitral respectively, is the septum right here. This is predominantly what we see in red. So this is the infraseptum and it is to the right hand side or from the surgeon's view, the non-coronary side of the cusp of the aorta. The membranous septum, you can see the clear view here, would be sitting right there. 
What's important is when we look at the septum from the apex, we can see that the center portion of the A2 segment of the mitral valve right here shown in pink lies predominantly under the anterior septum. So this portion of the septum is underneath the green or anterior septum. You can uh, demarcate to some degree where this is because it's between the papillary muscles. And if you look up here, all of this is to the medial or center portion of the posterior medial papillary muscle in blue and center wise or towards the, the, the center axis of this anterior lateral head of the papillary muscle so, um, shown here in red. But it is not over here. And this is really important. This is another MRI image which shows if you follow the septum from base to apex, one consistent guide is to stay inside the papillary muscle heads. So this here would be the anterior papillary muscle here, the posterior uh, papillary muscle. And this predominantly, as shown here, is the anterior septum. Now here's the view from the surgeon's perspective. And if there's one takeaway point that's critical when you're doing a myectomy is to note this view. Here is the tip of A2. Here's the green anterior septum. But notice when we look in there and look towards the septum, this part of the aortic wall I, I cut away, what we see most easily is the infraseptum. And not only the infraseptum, the very, very posterior part of the infraseptum. And I think this is where a lot of trouble occurs because the ease, when we put our left hand here, left hand in here, and the scalpel in our right hand here, is to cut here. It's very challenging to, to see the antercept, you can barely see the anterolateral papillary muscle. So it's important to, to, to really take a moment when starting a septomyectomy is to find the A2 segment, find the posterior medial papillary muscle, identify the anterolateral papillary muscle, which can be hard to see, and, and, and focus on staying in between those two papillary muscles. Again, you can see here, you can stay between the papillary muscles going all the way down. You can take it all the way to the apex and avoid getting on this side of the posterior medial papillary muscle because it's thin and, and a VSD will occur here. If you get on this side, this is the LAD right here, you'll start to enter the lateral wall. So staying above this, and above this is absolutely critical. So in previous videos and talks, I would describe how I do this. Here's the initial resections. I make note that the obstruction occurs 1.5 to two centimeters below the nadir of the right coronary cusp, which is shown here. Now Morrow's original description to, uh, states to begin the resection three millimeters below the nadir of the cusp, which is up here, membranous septum is here, bundle of his. So there's no need to be this high on the septum. The obstruction simply doesn't occur there. I typically take my first cut here, which I'll show you, my second cut here, and the third over here. And note the arc of the cut, the lateral cuts, go higher, since there's no conduction system, and go further around, whereas the, as the ones that go towards the infraseptum start to dive much quicker and, 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 and use the posterior medial papillary muscle to guide the right wood, right wood approach, again, since it's thin here, and the membranous septum is up here. And that's what's shown uh, here with the circle and the X through it is stay away from this area. And it makes a great deal of sense. The obstruction occurs down here 
or due to how flow vortices are generated well within the ventricle, but not over here. So this is the first cut. This is the second cut, and you can see it's diving and turning sharply. And then the third cut continues over here, rising higher toward, and then ending towards the left trigon. This is important right here. The cut should head straight down, again, because the, the, the posterior medial pap, I mean the anterior lateral papillary muscle is your lateral border, which defines what you do. And that's shown again here. As you make the cut and you go towards the anterior lateral, there's no reason to get out over here. You can finish right here and then the, the farthest I go is generally in the center portion of the anterior lateral papillary muscle as a guide. Now when I'm doing mid-cavitary and apical myectomies through a transaortic incision, in addition to the one, two, three approach that I have at the base, I begin to I continue that one, two, three approach and march it towards the apex as shown here. So looking at it this way, your initial cut up at the base, or towards the base, would be one. I then take some more here to the posterior, posterior medial papillary muscle, two. Then over here uh, is the third. And I start again here, further down apically, one, two, three. And you can continue one, two, three, back and forth all the way to the apex using the papillary muscles as a guide to where you stay between. You just go back and forth between the two. And this, this rectangle's a little off, off axis, but then if there's any sharp ledge that you've left after you've done that, you just smooth it out. Again, being aware way up here to avoid going near the membranous septum. So in summary, you can approach the septum by focusing on where the papillary muscles are. Once you know where the hypertrophy is localized, then stay between the papillary muscles as a guide. And if you have the opportunity to use a 3D model and can color it in a fashion similar to, to what I did, you can use that to really help understand the three-dimensional anatomy from the base and the apex and from the perspective of the septum as it spirals counterclockwise from base to apex. I want to thank you for your time.